I'm really happy to be here um, today speaking to you because it wasn't, at least to me, it doesn't feel like that long ago um, that I was sitting in the very seats that you're in now. I guess they may have replaced them in the past 12 years, but I was sitting in this room listening to somebody giving a lecture very much like mine. Um, I suspect it was probably Joe Salerno. Uh, I got to hear a lot of the same people you get to hear. Um, naturally not myself. Um, but I am very excited to give the lecture on money um, because the reason I became an economist was because I'd rather study money than have any. Right? My wife doesn't like that joke, but is, <laughs> is painfully aware that it's not really a joke. Uh, <laughs> So, so first, I want to talk a bit about kind of the social value that money provides to us. And here, I really want to make a point, um, piggybacking on what Dr. Herbner was just talking about with the division of labor, and say that money, by easing trade, by in some way helping to eliminate right, some of these barriers that exist to trade, allows us to undertake a greater division of labor, and thereby makes, makes us more productive, and in fact, value one another, because after all, I value not just as a person, but also as a potential trade partner, as we can make each other better off. So in order to show this, um, let's look through some of the alternatives. Right, we have a monetary economy that we are very familiar with. We have some sense of how that works. Um, what else could we do? Right? One possibility, again, Dr. Herbner mentioned, was we could have a totally self-sufficient economy, right, where each of us relies upon our own production right, to produce everything that we need and want. Now here, as others have said, this would probably result in mass poverty and starvation. I can think about my own case in some of the little free time I have. I have a garden in my backyard, and I try to grow various things. So I, so I plant broccoli. I always mistime my broccoli, so it dies because it gets too hot and it doesn't like that. Cauliflower is the same way. Right? I plant tomatoes. The tomatoes inevitably catch some kind of disease and die. Right? I, I plant strawberries. The strawberries do very, very well. And it ends up the ants watch the strawberries closer than I do, and they eat all of my strawberries. Right? I think the one thing that I got out of my garden this year so far is I did get some good green beans. But it ends up a quart of green beans is probably not a enough to let me survive over the course of this year. Right? So my guess is that in this world of self-sufficiency, I would end up dying. Right? That's a good reason for us not to go down that path, at least good enough for me. Another possibility, though, would be to have a world of exchange right, where each of us can, in fact, specialize in the area where we are more efficient. We undertake a division of labor. We get all the productivity gains of that. Right? But here we do run into a problem. That's the problem we call the double coincidence of wants, which Dr. Holzman did hint at in his lecture earlier today. And this is simply the fact that when I enter into this economy of barter, that for me to get what I want, I have to find someone who wants what I have. Right? So in a very simple example, what I have here, this um, nice pen, it is definitely used. You can see I've used it enough to wear off most of whatever was on it to start with. So maybe I have this pen, and I'd like to get a pair of earrings to give my wife as a gift. So how would this work? Well, we can imagine, as I take my pen to market, I'm going to meet four different types of people. Right? Some people don't have earrings and also don't want a pen. Right? These people are totally worthless to me. We have, we have nothing to provide each other. Right? Um, there's another set of people who want a pen, right, but don't have earrings. And again, they're not of any, any interest to me. I may be of interest to them, but they don't have anything to offer me that I would like in exchange. Now, there are other people who have what I want. Right? They have the earrings with them, but they don't want this pen. Right? So they're of interest to me, but I'm not of interest to them. So it is only this fourth group right, that has both earrings and also wants my pen that I can tra then trade with. Right? So we have this difficulty of how do we find the people that both want what I have and have what I want. It was a very challenging thing. Uh, I would suggest that the fact that this is challenging is going to change the way we make decisions about how we use our time in production. I, I will, in all likelihood, not spend a lot of time writing treatises on economics because I know that the number of people who want treatises uh, about economics is first relatively small, and odds are they're not growing food. Right, so I'm not going to spend my time doing that. Right, I'll find something else I'm not very good at. <laughs> not that I'm any good at writing treatises about economics, but I'll find something else that I'm probably even worse at, right, but that I know people will probably actually want. Right? So I might make rudimentary tools from wood from the tree that fell in my backyard, that kind of thing, because I know these rudimentary tools might be useful to farmers so I can trade it to them and get food to allow me to survive. Right? So the choices we make regarding productivity right, really come down to our expectations about what we think other people are willing to accept in exchange. Right? So um, how does money change this? Right? 
Well, now, first, I want to actually define money. Right? Right, money, in the words of Mises, is just a commonly accepted medium of exchange. Now, by nature, this is a very somewhat vague definition. Right? What do we mean by commonly accepted? That's not exactly clear where we draw the line. Do, do 80% of people have to accept it? Is 75 enough? Do we need 90, 95, or what? Um, fortunately, Mises also makes very clear, it doesn't really matter. Um, anything we say about any medium of exchange right, is going to apply to money and vice versa. And so we might face questions like, is Bitcoin money? Right? I suspect that in the United States as a whole, the answer is probably basically no, and that I expect most people I walk up to, if I offer to pay them Bitcoin for something, they'll decide it's not worth it to have to you know, download whatever app they need to make their wallet and all of that. They'll say, no, no, just pay me in cash. On the other hand, I suspect that in this room, Bitcoin would probably qualify as money, as I would guess that most of us here are already set up for receiving Bitcoin, so we'd be perfectly happy right, taking these types of um, things in exchange. Right, so, is it money or not? It's, it's kind of vague. Fortunately, it doesn't matter that it's kind of vague. So why did I spend all that time on it? Well, okay. Well, let's, let's move on. Okay, so then how do we get to this medium of exchange? Right, so I, let's imagine, right, here I am again, Right, I am producing right, these various um, wooden tools in my backyard. I'm hoping to take them right, to exchange for things that I would like to eat. Um, I like to eat meat, right, so I'm hoping to exchange these tools for some kind of meat. Right, but it ends up right, that when I get there um, to market, the first person I meet, right, they, they are not actually offering meat in exchange. What they have is wheat. Right? Well, I'm not particularly interested in wheat. Right? My wife loves bread, but I don't particularly care for it that much. Right? But I may decide that, in fact, it might be worthwhile right, for me to accept wheat. After all, even though I don't have any use for it, I know lots of people do, because there are lots of people that really like bread and eat bread. Right? So... I may get this bright idea of, yes, I will take your wheat, so I'll exchange right, these wooden tools that I have in exchange for your wheat, with the hope that I can then take that wheat and later exchange it for something that I want, like meat. And so we then have right, this entrepreneurial person that decides that they're willing to trade not just for something that they want, but for something they expect other people will want more than the thing they had to start with. Right? And so this is how we get the rise of a medium of exchange. The medium of exchange just being an item that I'm willing to accept, right, that I don't plan to use directly. I'm going to just use it in exchange to get the thing that I actually want. So what then happens if I start doing this? Right? We would expect that as we are social creatures interacting in markets, people notice that now there's someone else out there that's willing to take wheat. Right? Others might get, then get the bright idea, well, in that case, it might make sense for me to also accept wheat. Even if I am on a paleo diet and would never eat anything with wheat in it, it might make sense for me to go ahead and accept wheat because I know it's easy to get rid of. After all, all the wheat eaters will take it, and so will Engelhart, and so will perhaps these other people have also noticed. So we end up seeing the rise of a medium of exchange and the spread of a medium of exchange throughout a trade network as it becomes more popular. In fact, it ends up the medium of exchange is very much like things like Facebook or language in that it becomes more useful the more that people use it. Right? Imagine being the first person on Facebook. Right? Not particularly useful. Right? The first person to develop a word in a language. That's well, not particularly useful until someone else uses it. But as other people use it, it then becomes more useful and we see more, more, ad more adoption of that particular thing. In this case, the medium of exchange. As more people accept wheat, wheat becomes more acceptable, right? with the result being that it spreads throughout the economy and becomes a commonly accepted medium of exchange, what we would call money. So let's then look at what exactly does a medium of exchange, or specifically money, do in an economy? What functions does it perform? Uh, first, Obviously, money serves as a medium of exchange, and, and so it allows exchange to be easier. Right, thinking back to my example about the pen and the earrings, right, now there are two sets of people that might be interesting to me. Right? After all, right, now there are those people that don't have what I want and also don't want what I have. Again, they're, they're not going to be worthwhile to me. But then there are those people right, that want what I have but don't have what I want. Right? But what they do have is money. And I'm willing to accept money because I know money is easy to get rid of, right? So I'm very happy to sell my pen for a sufficient amount of money if I think I can use that money to buy earrings later on, right? So this is a group of people that I would not have been willing to trade with before that now I can trade with, right? And now once I get money, now I can go out and find somebody that has what I want, that has those earrings, even if they didn't want a pen to start with, because they want money, right? 
Right, so what we've just done is create this double coincidence of wants, that is, the likelihood that you have what I want while I have what you want has just increased substantially. Right? Two more groups that I can now trade with of those original four. Since, in effect, everyone wants money and everyone has money, at least to some degree. Right, so, as a medium of exchange, we know that money then eases transactions right, and thereby allows us to start taking more risks with the things that we would want to produce. Right, after all, I don't have to find a lot of people that want my economic treatise, I just have to find a handful that are willing to pay enough. If they pay me in money, then I can go buy the meat that I would like. Another function of money right, is to serve as a unit of account. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, I'm going to allow I'm Professor, Professor Salerno to talk about this with economic calculation. Um, but one thing that money allows us to do is to calculate profit and loss and to thereby evaluate whether we've made good decisions in production. Another use of money is that it is a store of value. That is, over time, I can just hold on to money and it's basically going to stay the same thing. This makes it very different from things like, say, gallons of milk would generally not make very good money. Right? Keep a gallon of milk for a couple months. It's not the same gallon of milk. Trust me, it's not the same gallon of milk. Right. On the other hand, there are some things that store very well. Um, we'll get to one of them in a minute. Things like gold and silver right, store very well, so that may, in fact, serve this store of value purpose very, very well. And the fourth traditional use of the value of money, uh, or of money would be to serve as a standard of deferred payment, which is just to say that debts are given and repaid in money. This is just another form of the medium of exchange. It's just instead of happening at that point of exchange, it's happening over time. Right? So I give you money now in exchange for the promise that you'll pay me back with more money later. So taking these functions in hand, right, we can think about traits that would make a good money. Right? First, since money is used in trade, it should naturally be portable. It should be something we can easily take with us. Right? It might be that, say, I don't know, Wheelbarrows full of dirt are generally not a very good money. They don't have a lot of value for the amount of bulk. It's very difficult to buy things with wheelbarrows full of dirt. And so we would generally shy away from such money. And so we want something portable. That, it, that is, it has a high value for the amount of weight involved and also for the size involved. We'd also want something that is divisible. Now, there's reasonable anthropological evidence that one of the early monies was cattle. People would use like goats and sheep and you know, oxen and what have you and would think of this in terms of money. Um, but we did move away from that and I think there's a good reason for that. Um, and that is that two halves of a goat are fundamentally different from one goat. It's, it's not the same thing anymore. Right? Now there are other things you can divide very easily and put back together very easily that may serve therefore as a better money. A third thing is we would like our money to be fungible. That is, that one unit of money is basically equivalent to any, to any other unit of money. Right? So this is why we, despite the fact that they are very valuable, things like diamonds tend not to act very much as, in a monetary way, because each diamond is somewhat unique, I am told. Uh, I don't have a very good eye for them, but I am assured that each diamond is somewhat unique. They are somewhat different from one another, which makes it very difficult to use them as a form of money. Um, naturally, we should also have this money be scarce, because it should have some kind of natural scarcity with it that is connected to portability and having a high value. Finally, it should be something that has a broad-based demand, that is, lots of people should want this money, obviously, if I'm using it in exchange, and I want to increase the possibility of exchanges happening, I need to have some kind of good that lots of people are willing to accept. Right, so we have all these traits um, that would make money good. Right. Now, over time, we've seen that the market has decided that gold and silver in particular, as I mentioned before, serve very well in this function. When left to its own devices, markets have almost universally chosen gold and silver, these precious metals, to serve as money. It shouldn't be shocking, right? They're naturally scarce. After all, being naturally scarce means then that they have a high value. And it ends up that many people find them beautiful. My wife assures me that silver jewelry is wonderful. I got very lucky with the woman I married that she likes silver more than gold. <laughs> right? But she assures me, it's a, this beautiful thing, it's nice to just own and have it around and 
you put it on your fingers, around your neck, and what have you. Right? So it is something that is very valuable, and at the same time, we know it's very scarce. It's easily divisible, or right? you can actually literally cut a coin up into eight different pieces. We can call them pieces of eight, and then later on, you can melt it back down, put it all together, and you've lost virtually nothing in the process. Right? For a particular quality of gold coin, it doesn't particularly matter right, which gold coin you're looking at. Right? If it's the same quality, the same weight, it's totally interchangeable, perfectly fungible. Right. And naturally, the broad-based demand, we can imagine that in, agra in agrarian societies, gold probably didn't have a broad-based demand to start with, but it achieved it over time. Right. After all, all we need is somebody to realize that gold stores a lot better than wheat. Rats are less likely to eat it. Right. So maybe what I should do is get rid of all this wheat that I'm storing and get something that's a little bit more durable, something like gold or silver, and which it ends up is also easier to transport as it's much smaller and holds a lot of value in that small piece. Right, so as this happens, we then see people switching over, right, start acquiring gold, and the, the breadth of demand for gold starts to increase as more and more people recognize that this does make perfect sense. So spreading then through the trade network, just like the original money in, this, in our example wheat did, right, we see the demand for gold spreading through until gold is then used as money. Right, so here we can um, see not just how money arises, but how we can switch from one money to another one. As some entrepreneur discovers that some other good has better traits as money and just begins using it. Right? This by itself starts to make it more acceptable to other people to use this money. And as a result, more people do. And we see the spread. Now this does lead to the natural question, how then do we end up where we are today, where we're not using gold and silver as money, instead most of us are using paper currency. Well, that's another story. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into it, except to say that for reasons we'll get to, government finds getting involved in money very tempting. Right? It ends up there are good reasons you might want to be the producer of money. Right? And it ends up governments inevitably get involved with the production of money. And in our case historically, right, they have taken paper money and gold money, which did exist side by side in effect, where the gold, where the gold was claimed to by the paper, right? So you had gold certificates, so they bring $20.67 worth of um, bit these bills, and that's equivalent to one ounce of gold. Just take to your neighborhood bank, and they'll give you an ounce of gold coin. And so we had these tied together, right, where you could then just carry the paper, which is lighter, it ends up than gold. There are good reasons to maybe use this paper if it is redeemable for gold. Right? But as soon as that happened, and the gold started to get isolated in banks, now we created the possibility of breaking the tie between the two. And that is exactly what we know historically happened. Um, here within the United States, that tie was broken in the 1930s. Then we broke that tie with the rest of the world, the tie between the dollar and gold in the 1970s. So now we have this paper money. Right? But nonetheless, that paper money has this connection with gold, right, which then provided the foundation for its value. We can also imagine the introduction of new money by governments. Um, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I'll let Dr. Bagus talk about Europe more. But it's imaginable that, say, a country might decide that it's, shut, it's going to shut down all of its bank for some, all banks for some period of time, decides it doesn't want to use the euro anymore. Right? So it just declares to people, oh, remember all those euro you had? Well, we're going to call them drachma now, and we can print as many as we like of them. Right? This is something we could imagine governments trying to do with more or less success, we may see. Okay. All right, so, so we have some idea then, what is the social value of money? Right? It allows us to exchange more, it opens up the possibility of trading with more people. Um, but what about the specific value of money? What is it that makes a dollar worth a dollar, a euro worth a euro, a yen worth a yen? Now here we need to kind of get into um, the idea of what exactly is the price of money. Right? Once we can establish that money has a price, our task on this point is going to be very, very easy. We already talked about supply and demand and the determination of prices. Right, so how do we think about the price of money? After all, with most goods, we say, well, the price is just, you know, this t-shirt is $10 is the price. I pay $10, I can get a t-shirt. Or if I'm selling t-shirts, I can sell the t-shirt and somebody gives me $10. Well, it ends up, we can do exactly the same thing with money. We say, well, if I sell this money, what can I get in exchange? Right, so if I'm giving up this money to get other things, what are the other things I can get? Now, one complication is that in a monetary economy, virtually every good we know is traded for money. So when we think about the price of t-shirts, we think in a monetary term. Right, we can't really do that with money. We sell the dollar for a dollar, 
doesn't tell us anything at all. Uh, instead, money is traded for everything. So we need to list out what are all the possibilities that I could get for this dollar. Right? So the purchasing power of a dollar might be one-tenth of a t-shirt, might be one two-hundred-thousandth of a particular house, it might be one-tenth of an hour of labor of a particular type in a particular job. Right, so when we think in this way, we can really call this, right, what's the purchasing power of money? Right? What is it that money can buy? Right? And that is how we're going to think of it. So now, just take out anywhere we, we said price before, stick in purchasing power of money, and supply and demand works, right? which is just a, just a marvelous thing and a great insight from Mises. We don't need a totally different theory to explain the value of money. We have supply and demand. It explains the value of things in exchange. All we need to do is give a name to the value of money, the purchasing power of money, and we're there. Right? So as with any good, if we increase the supply of money, we would expect its value in exchange, that is its purchasing power, to decrease. Right? On the other hand, if the supply of money decreased somehow, I right, would then end up with a greater value for each unit of the good, right? a greater value for each dollar, for each euro, or what have you. If the demand for money increases, we would expect its value to increase in exchange. If the, if the demand for money decreases, we'd expect its value to decrease in exchange, just as in any other good. If the demand increases, the value increases. Demand decreases, the value decreases. So in many ways, money is pretty much just like everything else in terms of determining its specific value. Uh, but there is an exception. If we really get down right, to the individual level and think about the demand for money, we realize money is somewhat different than other goods. Right? For most goods, so I think again of this pen, right? the process that I go through is first I recognize that this pen has some specific objective use that we all recognize, right? That is that I can write with it, and this is something that I may value. Right? And then I attach to this a subjective value in the way that Dr. Holtzman described earlier, right? So I decide what am I willing to give up in order to get this pen. Now we can think in terms of apples, we can think in terms of money. Let's just think in terms of money, because that's what we normally do, right? So I then determine subjectively what is this thing worth. Right? As we have everyone doing this, those that are supplying, those that are supplying pens, those that are demanding pens, right? we have the interaction of supply and demand, then determining the objective exchange value, or what we'd call the price of the pen. Right? So it all starts where we have some specific use for the good. Right? This then turns into the subjective value we place on the good in that use, which then turns into the demand for and supply of that good, which then gives us the price. Money's a little bit different, right? Because the reason that I want money right, is that I can buy things with it, right? I don't expect to use the thing directly, right? So I don't say, oh, I like these dollars because I can put them on my wall, though we may eventually get to the point that that is the way I should wallpaper things. <laughs> but, but that's not the reason that I value money. I value money because I know other people value money which puts us in a nasty circle, right? Because how do I know other people value money? Well, I've seen that money has purchasing power, right? So the demand for money, like demand for anything else, right, determines the price of money or the purchasing power of money. But the purchasing power of money has to be there for me to have any demand for money to start with, right? So we end up with this horrible circle, which logicians do not like. As someone who th considers himself more of a pure economist, I don't care that much about, about logic. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm sure there are people that are very concerned about this circle. Right? Well, so how do we solve it? Now, this is one of Mises' great insights. And he says, if we think about it, right, let's think back to the way we think about the origin of money. And instead of reasoning forward right, from barter into having a monetary economy, let's reason backward right, from money back to barter. Right? So when we say, OK, Engelhard, you say that you want money because you see that money has a purchasing power. What's really happening right, is that you have a demand for money today, and the demand for money today will help to determine the purchasing power of money today. Right? But the demand for money today is not based on the purchasing power of money today. It's based on what you saw the previous day. That is, I saw in the past that money had value, and therefore I decided, yes, I am willing to accept money now. Okay, so it's not really a circle once we add the time dimension. Instead, my demand for money today is determined by the purchasing power of money yesterday, which then makes me form expectations that give me the demand for money today. All right, so we can step back. Tied to the microphone, so I can't actually step back, so I'll move the timeline forward. All right, so yesterday... Yesterday, we had that demand for money determined the purchasing power of money, but the demand for money yesterday was determined from the fact that I saw a purchasing power of money the day before yesterday. Right? Shift the timeline, we can do this again, and again, and again, and I have to do it a long, long time because we've been using money a long time. Um, but where does this stop? Right? So now we've taken what looks like a circle, we've changed it into this infinite regress going backward all the way 
to the Big Bang, it seems, but it doesn't. Right? And that's the brilliance of Mises. He says it doesn't go back to the Big Bang. It doesn't go back infinitely. It stops right there on that last day of barter, right? which tells us something about how money had to have originated. Right? Money had to have had some kind of value in exchange before it was used as money. Right? That is, as we can think about the wheat example, right, the reason I was willing to accept wheat was because I knew wheat was valuable in exchange. It was valuable in exchange the previous day, not because people were using it as money, but because people baked bread. Right? Right, so that is, in fact, um, what we call the regression theorem. That is, we can regress the value of money back through time to when that money had to have been tied to some sort of useful commodity that did have some direct use that people valued. But this then suggests that it's going to be very difficult for us to say, as a government, just print up a bunch of money, right, drop it out of a helicopter and tell people to start using this thing. Right? It's not going to work. Right? People have absolutely no basis for determining how much of this they should ask in any exchange, how much they should be willing um, to give up in any exchange. Right? There's no basis whatsoever for that, with the result being there's no basis for a demand for money under this circumstance. And as a result, we're going to see this utterly fail. Okay. Now let's finally turn um, to changes in the money supply. Okay. Now the first point I want to make is that there is no specifically optimal supply of money. Um, this is something that is news to many um, monetary theorists nowadays. Or you see lots of papers published about what is the optimal money supply. Right? Well, if we really think about it, there isn't any specific optimal money supply. Well, and here's why. Right? Money, as money, is a third type of good. Right? Now, there are some goods we'd call consumer goods, right, which we can apply directly to our needs. Right? So when I eat that steak that is directly satisfying my hunger, it is a consumer good. Right? The more steak we have, the better, because lots of people like steak, and I like lots of steak. Right? So the more steak we have, the better, up to some degree. As long as it's a good, the more the better. And so consumer goods, increasing the production of those things, increasing the supply is beneficial. Right? Producer goods, right, these are goods that are not directly useful, but nonetheless can be transformed into something that is directly useful. Right, so here I think about that raw steak. Okay, I'm probably going to rub many people the wrong way. I like my steak well done. I like to forget that it was ever an animal. Right, right so I like my steak well done. The raw steak is not going to cut it for me. Right? We have to transform it through a process of cooking into something that I'm actually willing to consume. Right, so it's, it's a producer good. It's something that we then have to go through some steps of transformation. But we can unequivocally say that more raw steaks are better. Right? Some of you may just eat them that way. Um, other people like me say it's a producer good. Let's do some more process of transformation. It still makes me better off. Right? The more stuff that I have to do stuff with, right, the more stuff I end up with in the end. If you give me lots of raw steaks, right, I can have a bigger barbecue. I can eat more actually cooked steaks at the end of the day. Right? Right, so producer goods, the more the better. Right? As long as it's something that is actually a good where I have a use for more of it, right, the more the better. Money is different, though. Right? It ends up any quantity of money is technically going to work. Now, now in order to, to prove this, let's imagine right, two different economies operating side by side. Um, one of these economies is filled with clones of people from the other economy. Um, presumably, this happens sometime in the far future. Right, so we have these two different economies operating side by side. Each of the people is basically identical. The only difference is that in one economy, they have twice as much money as in the other economy. Right? Well, what is going to happen? I would suggest that it's sensible to believe that prices are just going to be twice as high in the economy with twice as much money. Right? So instead of $1 bills, we trade $2 bills, and it's basically the same thing as is happening next door right, with prices just being half as much. Right? Right? So then producing more money doesn't really do much to help us. Right? It, it in itself is not useful. Right? That is, any particular quantity is not useful. Any amount of money is going to work right? as long as it can serve in this um, medium of exchange capacity. Now, in reality, there's some exception to this. Right? Now, if we're talking about fiat money, what I just said is perfectly true. Right? Printing out more paper by itself is not really going to help anybody except for those few people that are actually wallpapering their walls using this as a consumer good. At this point, nobody, as far as I know, in the United States is doing this, except with pennies, it ends up. Pennies make very good, very cheap flooring. Um, it's true. It's true. <laughs> Check online their pictures and... We're actually tempted to do that with some of our countertops, it ends up. Anyway, right, so, so fiat money, for the most part, right, it's just being used as money. Having more of it is not beneficial, except for those people making countertops out of pennies. Um, now, there's an exception for commodity money. So what if we're using gold and silver? 
Now, having more gold and silver coins in itself may not be useful, but having more gold and silver is. After all, gold and silver isn't just used for coins. We can also use gold in, say, jewelry, also things that I'd be more interested in, like electronic applications and the like. Lots of gold used there. Right? Silver can be used in a lot of different capacities as well, not just as coinage. Right? So increasing the production of commodity monies may actually be valuable, not because we use it as money, but because it has other uses right, that are, in fact, valuable the more we have. So, so we talked about these two economies, right? So the one economy right, has half as much money as the other one. The other one has twice as much as the first. Now, it may be tempting to say, then, that increasing the quantity of money, say doubling it, wouldn't really do anything. We need to resist that temptation. Right? As Mises says, we may you know, line up these two examples, but it's one thing to say that this is kind of the way we could imagine things working. Another to say we can move from point A to point B, that is we can double the quantity of money without creating any kinds of disturbances along the way. Right, so the first model, right, the one that kind of suggests we can just drop money into the economy with no real effects whatsoever, sometimes called the Angel Gabriel model. Right, so you imagine the Angel, angel Gabriel right, blows his horn and immediately Right, every dollar turns into two, whether it's whatever form that dollar happened to take, whether it be in my wallet, which I left in my hotel room, whether it be in my bank account or what have you. Right, we can also call this um, model the helicopter model, right, which Ben Bernanke is very um, famous for, I guess. He says we can imagine right, we could fly around the economy, drop money out of the helicopter, right, and we do it roughly in proportion with where money already is. Right, so I guess you're dropping less money on the poor counties, more money on the wealthy counties, keeping everything in proportion, and then we're just going to see prices rise. But this isn't quite realistic. Um, at the very least, I uh, apparently the angel Gabriel for, forgot me, or helicopter Ben forgot my house when he was dropping money out. Right. That doesn't appear to be the way that things are actually working. Instead, right, money enters the economy at a specific place at a specific point in time. Right? As a result of this, right, it ends up that there may be benefits to increasing the, to increasing the quantity of money for the person increasing the quantity of money. Right? So now let's imagine, um, unlike the economy in which we have, let's say the monetary system there's counterfeiting involved in some significant way, right? So somebody may be creating in their basement, right, billions of dollars. They're just printing off $100 bills or something like that. Can we really say that they're not made better off by doing this? Well, that, that feels like we're going too far. It's one thing to say that society as a whole is not better off, right? We don't have more consumer and producer goods. But if I now have a bunch of $100 bills that I didn't have before, and nobody else has a bunch of extra $100 bills, I'm certainly made better off. Right? I now have more capacity to go out and buy stuff than other people would have just a day before. Right, so that then um, creates a great benefit right, for the money producer. Right? I, as the counterfeiter in my basement, I'm not actually a counterfeiter for any treasury people watching. Um, <laughs> I always run out of ink, so I'm not a very good counterfeiter. Um, Right. So, so I, don't, I don't actually counterfeit, but if I were, we can see it would be enormously beneficial for me to be the one producing the money. After all, I can go out and I can spend that money before prices have much room to change. Right? After all, it's a process by which people recognize the demand for goods has increased. Add to that the fact that now I have relatively more money than everyone else, so even if all the prices increased a little bit to adjust for um, the fact that I now have more money, I still have more money relative to everyone else. It's still beneficial to me. Right, so we end up with what we call Cantillon effects. Right there, right, the person that first creates, originates that money, benefits significantly as they then get to spend that money before it has lost much value. Right? Then this money ripples out right, to the next kind of ring around that person right, where I'm buying all these things from the people around me. Each of them gets a bunch of new money before prices have increased very much. They would also benefit. Right, it then goes to the ring where they're spending their money. They also get a bunch of new money before prices have increased too much. They've started to go up a bit. Right? But before prices have increased too much, they do get some of this new money, a significant share of it, so they are also made better off. Meanwhile, there are people way down at the end of the line right, that maybe never see this new money, that maybe only see it after it has been spent time and time again. Right? And as a result, they are made poorer. After all, they've been watching prices go up, go up, go up, as the amount of money they have has basically stayed the same. Right? They have not benefited at all from this 
increase in money. In fact, they're made worse, as now they can't afford as much as they used to. So, sure, the increase in the money supply doesn't benefit society as a whole, but it sure benefits whoever's producing the money. So is it any wonder, then, that the powers that be tend to take it upon themselves, right, to take on this, you know, this great responsibility of increasing and managing the money supply? It shouldn't be a shock at all. Right? Right, we can imagine in our economy, right, who is the first producer? Well, you know, in the, in the U.S., it's the Federal Reserve. Right? Where's the next stop? Well, it's the banking system, and to a large degree nowadays, the federal government. Right? Where's the next stop? And on, on down we go. All right, those of us that um, do things like take out mortgages. Right? I, I decided to move myself further up in the line recently. So, take out a mortgage, buy a house. Yeah, yeah that, that's beneficial to me because now I put myself third in line instead of wherever I was before. Okay. Right, so we end up redistributing things right, toward wherever that money was produced at the harm of all of those that are further away from money production. Okay. The last point that I'd like to discuss right, is about hyperinflation. Uh, I like to say there are two ways. If you ever decide you want to destroy an economy, um, there are two ways to do it. Right? Well, one way is to adopt Soviet-style central planning. Right? So adopt Soviet-style central planning, and this, is, this creates a nice slow death for the economy. Because right? we know that central planners are not any good at managing economies. Right? They're terrible at it for various reasons. I'll let Dr. Salerno talk about that in more detail um, later on. Right, so over time, we have these inefficiencies that build up, and people gradually get poorer and poorer, capital is destroyed, and we end up just destroying the economy over time. Right? Now, if you, like me, I'm very impatient about these kinds of things. So if I want to destroy an economy, I want to do it fast. Right? In that case, you use hyperinflation. Right? So, so you increase the money supply to a great, great degree, to the point where money is basically worthless. Now, Hyperinflation, though, is not an immediate thing. There's a process involved. Because we know, right, from what we've said before, that expectations play a significant role. And so what generally happens? Let's imagine, now we have a very stable monetary economy where prices are basically stable over time. Or we could imagine something like the United States nowadays. We know that prices rise on average something like 3% a year, between 2 and 3%, a little bit lower than that recently. But it's fairly low. Right? It's not this rapid increase in prices for the most part. Right, so then what happens if we increase the money supply um, in such a way that the money demand, in a sense, doesn't keep up with it? Well, naturally, we're going to see a big decrease in the purchasing power of money as lots of prices are going to rise. But how do people react to that in terms of their expectations? Right. Well, I think much of the time, if I'm watching the price of something and I see the price blip up, right, my immediate reaction is to say, well, this is just a blip. And you can tell the microphone loves my peas. Yeah, okay. It's just a blip, right? All right so prices are going to come back down. Right? What does that then do? Right? If I expect prices are going to fall in the future, flip that around, that means that I expect my money is going to be more valuable in the future. Right? Like with anything, if I think it's going to be more valuable in the future, I want to hold more of it. Right? Right? So this increase in the money supply does lead to some increase in prices, but at the same time, right, as people watch this happen, they increase their demand for money as they really think it's a temporary thing. Prices are going to come back down to a more reasonable, more normal level. And so what we would expect to see is a very small drop in the purchasing power of money at first. But it ends up that Typically, um, certainly in cases of hyperinflation, right, governments don't stop there. Right? They keep increasing the money supply, which means people keep observing day after day these increases in, the, in prices or these decreases in the purchasing power of money. Now, assuming that people are not total idiots, which I think is a fair assumption, right, one that politicians often ignore, right, people eventually notice, I mean, you know, prices are not, they didn't just blip up and then come back down, right? They blipped up and continue to blip up and blip up and blip up and blip up, blip up and so on we go, right? Prices are continuing to rise, right? Maybe I need to start thinking that prices are not going to fall, they're going to keep rising, which means my money over time is not going to become more valuable as prices come down to reasonable levels. It's going to become less valuable as prices keep rising over time. Well, then like with any asset, if I expect it's going to lose value over time, I don't want to hold so much of it, right? So the demand for money would expect to fall. So now what's happening in this stage, right? And now we are at the point where the supply of money is still increasing. It's been increasing the whole time, but expectations have flipped. So now people no longer expect prices to fall back to normal. They expect them to rise. Demand for money is falling. 
increase the supply of a good, decrease the demand for the good, the value of the good is going to fall rapidly. And that's exactly what we see in the second stage. We see an increase in the rate of increasing in prices or the decrease in the purchasing power of money. And so prices start rising very, very rapidly. So people are going out, buying whatever they want, buying it as quickly as they possibly can. Then we hit stage three. Right? Stage three is the point where people recognize that money is now no longer a reliable store of value, right? that in fact the best thing they can do with money is get rid of it as soon as they possibly can, and they don't necessarily care whether they get something they actually want to use in exchange. We call this the flight to real values, right? where you're just trying to get something that's actually real and may hold on to some kind of value. You definitely don't want to hold on to the money any longer than you have to. And this often leads to really strange things happening in the economy. Um, I've heard stories, I believe it was about Ecuador. When Ecuador went through a very serious hyperinflation several years ago, um, it changed the way that the economy ran, right? So the people were paid twice a day, right? I see so it paid at your lunch hour, and then people would run out with their paychecks, would buy whatever they could happen to buy within that hour so they didn't have to hold on to the money to the end of the day, because by the end of the day, prices would have risen, and that paycheck would have been worth less, right? You get paid again at the end of the day, you run out, you buy whatever you can before the stores close, because you don't want to hold on to that money overnight, because overnight prices are going to go up again, and you're going to lose value in that money. Right. So we end up with this flight to real values, the monetary system gets destroyed, people stop using money. Right. I have here one of the more recent cases. I've got very severe. I don't have any American money with me, but I do have my Zimbabwe dollars. Yeah, um, I have here 180 trillion dollars. <laughs> I paid 15 American dollars for them on eBay a few years ago. Um, I suspect they'd be worth less now. Uh, and that also included these sleeves, right, which suggest a certain amount of irrationality, because you kind of want the thing inside the sleeve to be more valuable than the sleeve, um, but I don't think that's the case here. Right? Um, right? Right, so, so how does this happen? Right? How does this happen that we have $180 trillion that I can buy for 15 American dollars? They're virtually worthless. Right? Well, it ends up, zeros are very cheap. And this is true. I, I looked up, before I um, came to give this lecture, I looked it up this morning just to make sure that I wasn't just making things up. Um, it ends up, it costs roughly five cents. It's just slightly less than that. Um, it's, I think, 4.9 cents on average to print a dollar bill, to print an American dollar bill. Right, so that means basically on every single dollar bill that um, gets printed, there's a 95% right, margin on that. Right, so, yeah, the production of money, it ends up as a very profitable thing. Right. Now, the $10 bill doesn't cost 50 cents. It doesn't cost 10 times as much. It costs about twice as much than there are additional security features in it. Right? So it's basically 10 or 11 cents if you're going to print a $10 bill. Right? A $100 bill, it ends up costing about 12 cents. Right? Yeah, okay, so it doesn't cost 10 times as much to make that as to make the $10 bill. Right? Zeros are cheap. Right? It's very easy for us to add zeros to the money, and if we just keep doing that, right, we've seen where it leads. And we can end up with $180 trillion that are effectively worthless. That, uh, as far as I know, the only market for these would be people like me that want something they can show in a lecture about money. Right? It's no longer useful as money. I certainly would not try to buy something right, using these Zimbabwe dollars. Right, so then how can we recover from that? Right? What, what, what then do we do if we face the situation right, where we have destroyed the economy, where we have taken that benefit that I mentioned at the beginning, right? money, binding society together by easing trade. We've just taken money out of the picture. Trade becomes very difficult. Society disintegrates. How do we get around that? How do we prevent that from happening? That's obviously not desirable. Well, one, one thing we've seen historically, and what it seems that economies will actually do, we saw this in Zimbabwe, we saw it in Ecuador, um, you adopt a different money. Right? Wait, wait, wait. We live in an economy where there are multiple monies out there, right? So, okay, our Zimbabwe dollars are worthless. Well, let's use the American dollar. It's fairly trustworthy. Let's use the euro. It's reasonably trustworthy. Let's use the South African rand. It's nearby and fairly trustworthy as well, right? So people, they don't, it ends up, revert back to barter necessarily. Right? They look for another thing that can function as money, and then they adopt that. Now, this should naturally make us very cautious about anyone who suggests that we should try to combine all of our efforts as a world economy, right? We should um, try to integrate our systems more by having just one single world fiat currency. Fortunately, I have not heard these recommendations very much recently. Those seem to have faded. Um, 
But what would that mean, right? If we do have this world fiat currency, we know that sometimes central banks make mistakes, right? Sometimes they do add too many zeros and they end up making the money worthless. In our current economy, we can deal with that, right? We can adopt the dollar, we can adopt something that is more stable. In an economy where this is, in fact, the only thing that is available to us as a money, what do we do? Well, I think we're stuck, right? Going back to right, the origin of money. Right? Revert to barter, we find something that can possibly be used as money. It will gradually be adopted by everyone as money. Right? Um, this, it's for reasons like this that I think we should be somewhat supportive um, of things like Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin, well, even if it isn't particularly widely adopted now, it's actually shockingly widely adopted given what it is. Um, what can it do, though? All right? In the event that we have hyperinflation, it is standing there. It is ready to take over. Right? Right? There are already expectations about what it's worth. Right? We already have some sense of it. It, in effect, is acting like the dollar did in Zimbabwe, or the American dollar did in Zimbabwe. Right? So allowing for this diversity of different monies to exist under the system we have, I think may be a very good idea, and a protection right, uh, for all of those benefits that money provides. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>